These slides summarize what the fossil record can tell us about the patterns of morphological change during evolution and the processes that contribute to those patterns. The fossil record is the only way to observe evolution over long time scales, and actually a number of important aspects of evolutionary theory were first proposed by paleontologists. The classical view of evolutionary change is that the morphology of a particular trait changes gradually through time as a result of natural selection. So this is called phyletic gradualism often, and remember from the classification exercise that you did that there's always variation within a species. So we can schematically illustrate the morphology of a particular trait as one of these little bell-shaped normal distributions on the left. So under gradual change, this phyletic gradualism, the midpoint of that bell curve will progressively shift in one direction um, as a result of natural selection, as illustrated again in this figure on the left. So one of the classic examples that was originally proposed as phyletic gradualism uh, is the evolution of shell coiling in this Jurassic bivalve called Gryphea. The horizontal axis on the right-hand plot measures the degree of valve coiling. You can see a little illustration of one of the valves on, or uh, one of the shells above. Um, and there are five different species shown vertically as these kind of peaked bell curves. The lowest isn't actually a Gryphea, but it was assumed to be one of like the ancestral forms. So these five species seem to follow a pretty nice gradual increase in the degree of shell coiling, from barely coiled to having one full coil to even one and a quarter full coils at the top. So and this was put forward as a really nice example of phyletic gradualism, a gradual increase in the degree of coiling within these different species. However, and this is a big however, um, this is a pretty short time series with only five samples. Uh, next class we'll get more into the importance of that problem. And more importantly, perhaps, it's not based on a phylogeny, so we don't even know if these are true pairs of ancestors and descendants. And they're probably not. The ancestral species at the bottom is almost really not the ancestor of the ones above it. So despite the issues with that particular Gryphea example, are there really a lot of examples of gradual evolutionary trends observed in the fossil record? So we'll look at that question again more in next class, but the simple answer is no, there really aren't. And in fact, stasis, which is fairly constant morphology, and geologically rapid change from one species to another are actually much more common, it seems. So you can maybe explain that pattern away by invoking incomplete sampling of the fossil record like on, on the right. So say, for example, your two studied intervals, interval one, interval two, may actually just be two little tiny time windows in this overall gradual trend. And if much of that time is missing at your site and there are no rocks or fossils from that age, you're not going to see this gradual trend. So that example is certainly possible in some cases, but it doesn't seem to be the story in the vast majority of, of instances. Instead, Stasis and rapid change, or punctuation, seems to be a real phenomenon, which is called punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium is first recognized with fossils and has become a really important aspect of evolutionary theory since then. So this figure on the bottom illustrates a really nice uh, study of a bryozoan genus uh, from the Miocene and the Pliocene. It's called Metrorhabdotos, but the name is not important. Um, in this picture, uh, geological time is, is vertical, and the evolutionary relationships between the different species of this genus are shown by lines. And those are based actually on phylogenetics and, and a real cladistic analysis. And morphology, quantified by some sort of morphometric study, is shown schematically, at least, as the horizontal axis. So morphology, morphology within a species exhibits stasis, or in the case of, of, the, of the species with the arrow here, it's pretty constant. Some other species have some small random fluctuations, but no clear trend. And the speciation events, like this one here, are geologically rapid. So this is a real great example of punctuated equilibrium. There's no evidence that there are gradual directional shifts in the morphology of any of these species. So a couple interesting questions arise from these types of observations. The first is, what actually causes stasis? 
But one possibility is that natural selection may primarily be stabilizing. That is, that the extreme morphologies are less likely to produce successful offspring, so individuals closer to the average morphology have greater fitness or more likely to pass their genes on to descendants. So that type of selection, the, the middle um, example of these bell curves, would tend to maintain the status quo or the existing conditions, as opposed to directional or disruptive selection, which are going to lead to morphological changes. So you can imagine that stabilizing selection might occur if environmental conditions also remain relatively stable so that a particular morphology remains well adapted over geological time. However, morphology has also remained fairly stable even through times of environmental change, such as the recent ice ages. So there are other hypotheses that have been proposed. Maybe species migrate to track their preferred environmental conditions, and that can operate in conjunction with this stabilizing selection. Maybe evolution of certain traits is difficult because the genes that relate to those traits also control other aspects of the organism's morphology. So maybe changes that might be positive for one would be very negative for another trait, and that really re will resi resist the amount of evolutionary change that you can see. You've also learned how many marine invertebrates have larvae that disperse widely. So maybe there's so much mixing of genetic material during breeding and dispersal, this mixing is also called gene flow, that the variability in morphology is just totally smoothed out and doesn't really change. So these hypotheses are not mutually exclusive, and there could be other reasons as well, but it's kind of beyond the scope of this class to really get into these details. That leads us to the second interesting question, and that is, what causes these rapid, or geologically rapid at least, evolutionary events during the punctuations? Well, to answer that question, you need to know a little bit about speciation, or the evolution of a new descendant species from its ancestor. So speciation is also a very complicated subject, and a lot of it is, is also well outside of the scope of this class. So I'll focus on just one mechanism that might be relevant to what we're thinking about here. And that mechanism is called allopatric speciation. It's thought to be a pretty common mechanism, but it's the evolution of species in physically separated populations. Simply, it argues that there's some sort of barrier that forms to separate two groups of the original species. Because those two groups might have somewhat different genetic material, just because of random sorting during the split, and they also may be subject to different environments and therefore different selective pressures, they can evolve in different directions after they're separated. Because they're separated, there's no genetic mixing or gene flow between the two groups. So after sufficient time, those two groups may have diverged enough so that when, when or if they're mixed back together, they can no longer interbreed and therefore are going to be different species. That divergence can happen pretty quickly, probably in a few hundred to a few thousand years, and it'll be helped along also if one of these isolated populations is small. In small populations, you're more likely to overrepresent particular rare genes. Uh, this is called the founder effect among other factors, which are not really important for our purposes. So if this model of allopatric speciation is actually common, speciation may occur in a small population that's not preserved in the fossil record, and so the punctuation may then represent the geographic expansion of that species after it's originated in this little tiny area that we're not looking at. However, it's not even necessary to argue for that small, non-preserved region because speciation is probably quick enough, like hundreds or thousands of years, that it can't be resolved in the geological record anyways, except in extremely fossil, extremely common fossil groups. So remember how there's always gaps within a species observed range, and that those gaps are going to be larger and more frequent for rare species. So I want to end with a quick example of punctuated equilibrium in these things called conodonts. Conodonts were small, kind of lamprey-like vertebrates or fish, um, best known from their tooth-like elements. The elements are characterized by a whole number of different features, such as the degree of serration, or the spacing or the fusion of the little bumps called denticles. And those elements are extremely common fossils, or microfossils, used for biostratigraphy. So you don't need to know any of the details of this example about condonts or about the particular taxa or anything like that. 
So the species on the right, called Clarkina postbitteri, is thought to have evolved from the species on the left, called Gino gondola granti, around the middle late Permian boundary. There's actually a transitional form called Clarkina postbitteri hongshuiensis that has intermediate morphologies capturing this rapid evolution during the punctuation. There are multiple morphotypes of this intermediate form that have different combinations of the plesiomorphic or the ancestral characters and the apomorphic or the newly derived characters, including some of these that are actually intermediate between the two states, like 1.5 is intermediate between 1 and 2, and 3.5, same thing. So we can see stasis in Genogondola granti, perhaps for a couple hundred thousand years, followed by fairly rapid evolution of these traits through the intermediate form to C postbitteri. Um, you can see the sort of rapid change stratigraphically that occurs within less than a few tens of centimeters of rock thickness. Just to be clear with these plots, the horizontal scale on this one here doesn't indicate morphology, it's kind of arbitrary. So it's unlike the previous ones. This evolutionary shift coincided with a low point in sea level, which is consistent with fragmenting of populations and allopatric speciation. So this kind of example demonstrates how powerful the fossil record can really be for understanding evolutionary patterns and the processes that control those evolution, that evolution, uh, especially in such superabundant groups that allow these types of high-resolution studies.